In this video, we're going to discuss calorimetry. Calor, as in heat, heat energy, metry as in measurement. So this is our measure of heat transfer and heat energy in a given system. We have a bunch of different types of calorimetry setups, but these are laboratory techniques that we use to measure and calculate our heat values. You know, remember those delta H values, that enthalpy values? and Hess's law and those standard enthalpy values, well, calorimetry is actually how we find those values and how we figure them out. So we're going to dive in and talk about the basics of calorimetry and the equations you need to know with a calorimetry setup. Let's dive in. So what is calorimetry? Basically, it just measures our heat transfer. Calor, heat, metry, measurement. Now we know that heat typically transfers due to a temperature difference. So we have a specific equation to measure that heat transfer. And that equation is Q, as in heat, heat energy transfer, equals MC delta T. So let's walk through this relationship. Working backwards, delta T is our change in temperature. If we are changing positively, if delta T is increasing or going up in a positive way, that also means a positive heat transfer, greater than zero heat transfer, which means that we've absorbed heat. If our delta T is decreasing, we're going down in temperature, then our heat transfer will be less than zero. It'll be negative Q, and that means that we're releasing heat. Our heat, our temperature is going down. Next up we have, we'll skip C for just for a second. Next up we have mass, masses of the sample. So the mass of the sample does matter because the mass of the sample lets us know how much heat we can kind of hold and absorb and release. So mass is usually in grams here, can be in kilograms as well. And then finally, we have C, which is the specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is a characteristic of the compound that we're working with or the sample. And it basically says like, here's how much heat that this thing can absorb or release. Specifically, the definition is how much heat it would take to increase one gram of the sample by one degree Celsius. So if we had one gram of water, let's say, and we wanted to increase it by one degree Celsius, how much heat would that take? Well, for water, for pure water, that would be 4.2 joules per grams degrees Celsius. And this is a constant of any pure water. Uh, this is actually a relatively high heat capacity, specific heat capacity, uh, which is one of the reasons why water is pretty unique. It, it can hold a lot of, it takes a lot of heat to just increase just even one gram, one degree Celsius. So here's the three relationships. We have our mass of our, in, our sample, we have our specific heat, capacity of our sample, and we have our change in temperature, which usually defines the sign value of our heat. Well, if it's negative, that means we're releasing heat. And if it's positive, that means we're absorbing heat, just like delta H, right? Uh, positive delta H is endothermic, which means we absorb heat. Very similar, very analogous here. And a negative delta H, right? Exothermic, releasing heat. So our delta H is usually in joules or kilojoules per mole. So that's where we care about our per mole, whereas this guy here is just usually in our measurement of joules. We could also measure heat, not just in joules, which is an energy value, but we can also measure it in calories. And this is something that's unique to calorimetry. So it can be in joules, which is energy, but another energy can measure can be calories. And we use calories often when we're talking about our food. So if we wanna know how much energy is in our food and the bonds in our food, we'll often use calories. So just be ready. Sometimes we'll be using joules, sometimes we'll be using calories, but they're both measures of heat energy. Okay, so, so far we've just talked about setting up our relationship, but what about this heat transfer piece? Well, in a given isolated system, let's say that we have a styrofoam coffee cup. This is our classic calorimetry experiment. And it's sealed, right? We have maybe a thermometer sticking out of it, but it's sealed. And let's say that it's perfectly insulated and it's an isolated system. That means that no heat or matter can be exchanged with the outer environment, right? Can ex be exchanged. And let's say that we 
observe that the water, let's say there's pure water in this, and let's say that we stick some sample into the water and we observe that the water increases in temperature. Well, that must have meant that that sample must have transferred heat to the water. And we can measure that transfer of heat based on how much heat was gained by the water. So our heat that's gained by the water, Q equals m cat of the water, right? So heat, uh, temperature increase, mass of the water, specific heat of the water. Well, that's gonna equal the heat absorbed by the water. Where did that heat come from? The sample. And so our Q absorbed by the water is gonna equal the heat, the Q released by the sample. And so we can figure out all sorts of cool stuff about that sample based on the heat released and things like that. So that's essentially how calorimetry works, is that we have an isolated system, and within that isolated system, some form of heat transfer is occurring. And as long as we measure the temperature change and we know the masses of what's going on and the specific heat of that material, we can then calculate the heat that's exchanged. It's a pretty cool system, and there's a lot of real-world benefits to being able to measure that heat. For example, there's a type of calorimetry called bomb calorimetry, where we put a sample of food or something like that, like an apple, and then we combust it. We break all the bonds. And the heat released from those bonds goes into the water and we can measure how much heat was released. And that's how we can get calories of food. So it's a pretty cool system and definitely worth practicing. But the key thing I want you to recognize is in a perfectly isolated system, any heat absorbed by the water will be from the heat released from the sample. When you're calculating Q, make sure you're using the right variables. If you're calculating the heat of the water, absorbed by the water, we need to use the mass of the water, specific heat of the water, and change in temperature of the water. If you're measuring the heat released by the sample, we would need to know the mass of the sample, the change of temperature of the sample, and the C, the specific heat capacity of the sample. Now there's one more term that we often can use with calorimetry and that's just called heat capacity. Heat capacity just is the energy required to increase anything one degree Celsius. So we just take mass out of it and it's just equal to heat over change in temperature. So sometimes we'll refer to heat capacity, which means that we don't care about mass. Whereas if we're talking specific heat capacity, we care about that specific amount of heating up one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So heat capacity is a little bit more of a general term here. Okay, and that was the basics of calorimetry, which is how we measure heat transfer. And one of the ways that we can figure out heats of formation, delta H's of given materials. I hope that was helpful and I'll see you in the next lesson.